So as it says on the agenda, this special meeting is to provide an update to the board based on the governor's proclamation that um, extended our school closure from the original date of um, April 24th, meaning we'd be able to go back on April 27th um, out through the rest of the school year. So um, in light of that, we wanted to um, bring the board up to date on um, a lot of the things that have been occurring, but really mainly the continuity of learning plan that we're working through. The governor specifically said the buildings, the facilities are closed, but the learning needs to continue. So we um, have had a lot of questions and feedbacks as we've entered this first week of new learning since it's our first week back from spring break. And we want to update the board on that as well as um, answer questions on some of the other things that have been ongoing since the original closure. Um, just to remind everyone that we are continuing to serve lunch every day and this week we started breakfast as well. So how that occurs for um, our families is we do still ask them to um, let us know their, their, their lunch preference. So we have that as our tracking me mechanism. And when our families come to pick up their meals, either at the middle school location or at the high school, they receive lunch for that day and breakfast for the next day. So they don't have to make two trips. It's a single trip to pick up both of those meals in um, one setting, so to speak. We have been serving upwards to 200 meals a day. Um, so we definitely are providing a need. We've heard lots of parents be very grateful for it um, and even using it as a way to establish that stability and structure for our children, which we know is so important to them, especially in a time like this, which is so disruptive. So to have that usual um, time of lunch to um, to have that kind of in the middle of the day and have that pause when they can go out and, and pick up their meals and then breakfast for the next day. Um, we have been partnering with Boys and Girls Club on our child care and that has not grown exponentially. It is a small group that we have been serving and they um, we're continuing to keep kind of our finger on the pulse of that if it if it grows or expands or the need um, does get to be more, then we will have to pivot and shift. But right now the needs are being met within the childcare program that was part of the governor's first mandate that he um, came out with. Any questions on nutrition or childcare? Donna, this is Carol Buss. Hi, Carol. I didn't see you there. We're so glad you're here. Right here. So I just wanted to let you know that when, since we've started breakfast in the last four days, we've served 1,486 meals in four days with the two meals combined. Wow. That's a lot of meals, Carol. Thank you so much to you and your staff. Um, as the board um, knows, um, Carol um, works for Chartwells, who is the company that we contract with, and they have been nothing more than amazing and supportive during this transition time. Um, we had a, a document that needed to be signed off by the district, and um, Carol's boss, John, knew that um, Ty, who usually oversees our food service, you don't see him on this meeting because Ty's new baby girl was born last Friday. And so we gave him a pass for, for this meeting this week. Um, his third, third little girl, fourth child, I think they now have four under five years old, help me out. Five years old, yep. So Carol's making faces. But anyways, John was, was really efficient with, with um, Carol and um, Kendall's help as well in making sure that we had all the right paperwork signed and off to OSPI. And, and they were also really responsive and got it all going so that we were able to start with our breakfast service this week as well. So um, we can't thank them enough for the, the service that they're providing. 
for our community. Any questions for Carol with food service? Um, I don't have any question for Carol because I think Carol, you're doing a wonderful job, you and your team uh, out there. I love to see the happy smiles and welcoming, um, you know, when the parents and the children come. But I do have a question more from a system level of how do we know that we are actually meeting, uh, feeding the students who are on a lower reduced lunch? So is there a way that we know who they are and are we checking in with them to make sure that they're getting the nutrition that they need during this time? So that is actually does fall under Carol. That is um, extremely private information. Um, very few of us have access to it. Carol is, is one of those people and does know um, who many of those families are. It's not something that we um, could use that information to reach out to them to say, um, we've noticed you're not using this because that would be a, a breach of the privacy that the law requires us to have for them as being identified in that category. Um, I'm kind of looking at Carol to, to, um, to see if she can give us any um, insight into it. It is, it is a small number for us. And so again, um, the privacy of those families and those students is highly protected. Carol, do you have any further to um, offer? We are seeing a lot of our free and reduced families. Um, a lot of the kids that we're not seeing are the high school kids. And I have noticed that. Um, and I mean, there may be a way for me to reach out. I mean, I could very much just send out a flyer letter, letting them know what we're doing, that it's available. Um, oh. Not necessarily that we didn't, you know, didn't see them so that, that we wouldn't be breaching any privacy in that. But um, I think it would be a good thing to, to reach out to the ones, especially the high schoolers. Just to Carol, I think um, part of the problem with the high school kids may be that lunches are available to pick up between 1130 and 1215. And the high school kids have 11 to 12 marked out as their lunchtime in terms of like when they don't have you know, Zooms and when they don't have kind of classes or class-like things. So there's not a lot of time in there if, if, they, if like a parent was going out to pick up and bring home or if they are able to drive themselves out to pick up and bring home. So I don't know whether it might be possible to, to give them like, as you get going, kind of like a couple days worth of lunches. Um, like I know some more rural districts have been doing where it's harder for people to get, you know, further distance to pick up lunches or something like that. Or maybe for the high school kids, there could be a little bit earlier pickup time, something like that. We, we, our time that we put, we're trying to straddle the times of all the schools because the middle school is 12 to one for their lunch. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. and then, um, as far as the multiple meals that goes, that's approved through OSBI on a case by case basis. Yeah. Uh, or the more rural communities. We haven't seen many high school kids, period, even before they had a schedule, um, which was kind of, you know, I was wondering about. So I don't know if, I don't know if the schedule has a lot to do with it. Um, we did expand our time to uh, 15 minutes to make it to 1230. So people oh, okay. have a little more time to get in. Yeah. Um, OSPI is also approve that parents can pick up for their children as long as they're on the pre-order list. The yeah. child doesn't have to be there. So, and you know, hopefully now that the kids are in school, maybe if they, if OSPI gets enough comments, we can get a little more leeway in. We're kind of struggling right now, even with the amount of food we're doing, even to get out at 1130. Okay. So I'd love okay. to go earlier, but I just, I just don't know that it's physically possible. Well, getting the word out may help, you know, if they, um, if you, if you just kind of remind them that it, that it exists. Right. Yeah. I, I, I thought maybe I would send a menu out too, so they can see what it is. Oh yeah. Right. See what they're, right. what they're, what they could come and get. So that might help. Make Thank sure you. you pasta on it, Carol. That's a high school favorite. Yeah. And Carol, I think we've done pasta three times, Donna, and yes, it's a favorite. <laughs> I, I'm just going to speak uh, high school kids it, developmentally guys. That's not a thing they do. We have been um, letting them know um, in some of our communiques. Um, we will continue to let them know. And I see our student yeah. reps are, are here as well. So I know they're taking notes for their next communication. They can, they can remind everyone that um, lunch is available as well. The problem is, what do our high schoolers want from what I think I'm hearing is they want to be able to see their friends. And because of the safety measures that we have to take and the physical distancing that we have to practice, 
they can't come and pick up their lunch and then have a picnic in the parking lot with their friends. And so it, I, I'm not sure it has as much um, meaning for them as it, as it might for some of the others. So any other questions for Carol for food service? Well, I do want to say that I think for developmentally for the high schoolers or teenagers, it's not very cool or it could be stigmatizing to think about that you're picking up these lunches. So I am, uh, I uh, do urge uh, the, our student representative to put out a, um, a larger message. We never want to target certain groups of students and we don't ever, we're never asking for private information. But like Carol, uh, it's great that you do know what's missing so that it can inform our strategy. And if stigmatized, if feeling stigmatized of going to pick up lunches that are for kindergartners or elementary schools, right? Then it just uh, gives us a better idea of how do we communicate and how do we make it normalize it. And so um, but I do think is uh, thank you, Carol, for having the, that information of who's using it and who is not able to access it. All right, so if we have no further questions on um, those two topics, we will move into, we, we do have a slide deck and we will take pauses along the slide deck um, to ask for uh, questions and or feedback from the board. Um, here's where it gets tricky. And Reeves, I think we decided you were gonna be the driver for the slide deck, is that correct? Yep, I'll share it here in just a second. Okay. So for the continu continuity of learning, um, I just lost something on my screen here, hopefully. Uh, still okay. All right. So this is a, um, an update and board members, just so you know, we will post this just with all, with all of our other COVID-19 resources on our website. So um, please continue to communicate and point families to that resource. Um, I know there's a lot there and um, but it is a great resource. That's where we're putting um, so much of our communication and information. Um, you know, we, we sit in this, this place of balance where we, um, we're now having, there's too much, there's too much communication. I have so many emails um, and we always are hearing, you know, there's not enough, communicate more. So, so we continue to find what that balance is um, and, We'll hope, hope that we can continue to, to meet the needs of everyone. So this continuity of learning plan was um, really sparked by the governor's proclamation. So, um, Andrews, I'm sorry, I'm only seeing panelists. I'm not seeing the slide deck. Do you have it on full play or? It should be sharing in full screen. I can see the slide deck. Okay. So did you go to slide two? I'm on slide two, I'm on the governor's proclamation. Okay. So just to reiterate, um, the governor's proclamation um, what came out extending to the end of the school year. It was a little bit different from his last um, proclamation. He did talk about that school facilities are closed to traditional in-person instruction, but that education must continue. And so this sparked um, a lot of conversation around how do we continue education? We were already moving towards some uh, online and, and remote learning. Um, with the thought of potentially opening before the end of the year, but now we knew we needed to shore that up even further. Um, the state superintendent, uh, Chris Reichtel, he then um, was with the governor during the proclamation and the guidance, we've had several guidance documents that have come from them. And their, um, the guidance that they provided, they've continued to reiterate is in, grounded in compassion, communication and common sense rather than traditional compliance. A lot of the traditional compliance pieces are being waived. 
um, an example was initially this all the state mandated testing was waived in the first proclamation. Um, the Chris Reichdahl, the state superintendent, made the statement that our schools are the backbone of our democ democracy and structures, routines, and ongoing learning opportunities will create the calm connection our students and family need at this critical time in our state. And I think that that um, is really where we want to, to ground our, our continuous learning and look to um, where we go next. So defining continuous learning, OSPI defined it as you see on slide three, establishing and maintaining connections with students and families to provide learning materials and supports using a variety of modalities. And of course they gave examples of all of those. So what does that mean for us? Their, um, OSPI sent out a guidance document that was, um, had several contributors to it. Um, superintendents, um, the deputy superintendent for OSPI, principals, teachers. Um, in fact, one of our teachers who was a representative for WEA, Tawny Lindquist, Tawny Lindquist was on the group that um, facilitated the Continuous Learning Plan 2020. We are now using that and making a Mercer Island continuity of learning plan. It is not completely finished yet and ready to be published, but um, you will be the first to see it when it is ready. But many of the pieces that you're going to see in the slide deck will be in there as well. Fred, do you have anything to add to this slide here? I don't. I, th I think that captures it. Um, it's an ongoing series of communications that we receive um, at a very irregular um, cadence, which is fine. I know OSPI is working as hard as anyone trying to get us information, but um, we're just doing the best we can to um, respond and, and stay within the banks of the river that they're providing. So moving to the next slide, we just dropped in here a reminder that um, on slide five that there's all of our schools. And so it, it does look different, of course, at each of the levels. And as we answer questions, we sometimes have to say it depends on the level um, as to how we answer that question. So our elementaries are all working very closely together. We have um, you know, curriculum across our system, first grade, fifth grade, sixth grade math, seventh grade social studies, that our teachers are working together um, to really move through this, this last part of this school year. So we have labeled this um, learning forward, and I think Jamie is going to um, talk about this timeline with you. Jamie? Andrea, you go to the next slide. There you go. Um, all right, there we go. Um, so where we are right now uh, in the April to June 2020, um, we're embarking and have begun new learning effective this week um, for elementary and high, and then middle school is really going to kick off their new learning uh, starting next Monday. Um, they've been reteaching skills and reviewing things, but the new stuff starts on Monday. Um, we've begun to embrace learning in a virtual setting, and it has changed and evolved every week since we've started um, the closure process. It started with um, what was deemed supplemental, and that was language provided by OSPI, and then moved into some optional supplemental, then it became review, and now we're moving towards, now that it's definitive that this is the way school is going to operate for the remainder of this school year, um, how do we then move learning forward? So we're in a constant cycle of growth and improvement and um, trying to figure out how to best meet student needs. Um, and sometimes we don't, students don't even know what they need because this isn't something that people have been trained to prepare for. Um, we've identified essential standards. So this has been across the board um, from K all the way through 12 as teams meet and figure out in teacher teams through PLCs, what are the essential standards and required learnings that we need to make sure that we cover 
through the remainder of the year. Um, when we have students in our brick and mortar buildings, we have the opportunity to add and um, do things that we, you know, we don't have time for, we don't have the resources for right now in this virtual setting. And so we had the teachers come together and really think about what do we need to make sure that students know and are able to do before the end of this year. We also will be then thinking about as we look at May and June, um, having to adjust courses for next year. We're not going to start in the same place next year that we have started typically at every given subject and grade level. We're gonna to have to make adjustments because we know the learning right now is different than it has been historically. Um, we're continuing with teacher collaboration and reflection and um, looking to see what is it going to look like as we form classes and re-engage in school next year. Um, so that's going to continue through this summer. And then in September, we're really going to have to look at where students are. And we've got to, we always assess at the beginning of the year, we look to see um, where, where students are starting in every given class and then what we need to build in order to have all students move forward and provide any scaffolding along those ways. So we know it's gonna be imperative more so than even in the past to really look at data and information about every student to help us drive what instruction is gonna look like next year. Um, and we're gonna be working to try to close the opportunity gaps and the achievement gaps um, because we know that for students, especially for whom who are not able to um, engage in the learning as robustly as perhaps others, um, that the gap is potentially going to widen. And we wanna make sure whether it's via summer school or targeted activities and interventions um, through RTI in the fall, that we look to, to close those achievement and opportunity gaps. Are there any, any questions? Um, I do wanna to reiterate to um, the board that you know, Jamie mentioned um, RTI and closing the opportunity gaps as we move forward in the fall. We are also working on um, what some ways we can do that in this virtual learning that we're doing. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we um, move through the slide deck. So it doesn't mean we're not doing that while we're in, in this um, continuous virtual uh, learning model, but we'll give you a little bit more information on that. Um, a little bit we deeper also, slide deck. Donna, we have um, principal reps from every level. Um, and I think we were hoping that they could um, jump in and share a little bit about what is happening and what people can look forward to. So I don't know if we want to start at any particular level, but I know that Vicki, Heidi, and Aaron are all here. And we're thinking that they were going to jump in and provide a little info. Does anyone want to start <laughs> with? Um, you know, how, how this kind of the marker of since spring break, I know we have um, some celebrations. We have lots of learning. Um, yesterday, pretty much all the staff that's on this call um, did a, a two hour kind of Q and A with our PTA council and Donna, I just stopped sharing so that people can see you talking. Okay. Um, I, lost, I lost all my visuals, so <laughs> I got panicked that I got kicked out of the meeting. That has happened to me before. Um, I'm sorry. So I was discussing that yesterday we had um, a group of our, it was our PTA council meeting, and so we had all of our PTA presidents um, at every school um, there, along with our learning services and our principals, and answered a lot of their questions and took feedback from them on what they were getting back from, from parents um, as we've progressed through this. We know that we've still um, got a lot of evolving to do and a lot of changing to do. We got some great feedback from parents as to how do we um, how do we evolve this? MIA was present at the meeting as well, and so heard um, some of those suggestions. And, and we're working with them on a kind of a FAQ that um, I'll work with our PTA co-president, Stephanie and, and Sarah, as to does it um, answer the, the questions that they've heard, and then we'll get that out on our website as well, because our PTA presidents are, are best advocates and communicators um, and they get a lot of questions from others so if they are able to um, have those answers 
at their fingertips and point people to where they can find them. So continuing to evolve, we've, we've learned a lot in a few short days this week. Um, uh, lots of celebrations. That was one of the, the questions is how, how will you acknowledge the celebrations? And um, one of them is, of course, through communicating them out. But another one is sharing them across um, our staff. So when we hear great things that are going on and, and how thrilled parents are, and I know the board received an email late today from a parent at one of our elementaries, absolutely thrilled with their first grade teacher and the um, interaction the teacher is having, certainly with their child, but from what they can tell with is every child in the classroom. And we share those celebrations and um, hope and help those teachers support other teachers in how do they make those contacts and those connections um, for our students because really that is the most important part of this. We have talked constantly about relationships and how important those are and they're even more important in this virtual setting that we are in. So any questions on this learning forward timeline? I don't think any of our principals are going to jump in, but do um, board directors have any questions? And then maybe our principals will be able to answer. I have a question and I'm sure it will be addressed um, during the presentation. So feel free to wait on the answer. But one thing that I've been hearing and I think other board members too is um, there appears to be a perceived um, difference in communication, especially with elementary school teachers. Um, I say perceived, um, but that's just a message that that I'm hearing a lot. And I'm just wondering if um, there is an expectation of a certain number of face-to-face -face contacts. Um, and if and if so, um, if that could be publicized, um, what the expectation is so that it might cut down in the misperceptions. Yeah. So you're right, we heard that too. And um, as the board knows, we have our Mercer Island Education Association and Erin Battersby and the leadership for MIA worked hard on a memorandum of understanding as soon as we went into closure as to what were the working conditions and expectations during this time. Um, the MOU is available on the website. Um, if you go to the section on the website, um, under collective bargaining agreements, it's right there at the top. It does not, um, I'm gonna use Aaron's language, does not contemplate a specific um, number of times or amount of times, but it does absolutely assure that um, teachers will be making connections with um, students, either in small group, one-on-one, um, -on -one, or whole class connections. Um, we've got that, we've actually got data on that after four days. <laughs> we are able to look at our platforms. So for the high school and middle school, it's our Schoology. So we're, uh, we are going to touch on this a little bit when we get to the attendance piece. But we're also, because we use the Zoom Pro format, we're able to see um, how that's being used at our sites. And so we are having those conversations um, at my level, they're with our site administrators to be reaching out to teachers who have not um, initiated those contacts. Um, we can do a lot better. We're not there yet and we can do a lot better. And if, um, if we need to press harder, we are absolutely going to be pressing harder that um, our kids need to see their teachers and just saying you want to see them isn't enough. Um, we, have, we have this great tool. And, and frankly, our kids need to see each other. So we are working really hard. Our IT department has made an abundance of videos on how to, um, how to use Zoom, how to use it with your students, even your youngest students. And so we are, um, we've heard that feedback too, Deborah, and that concern as well. And, and we're concerned with it. To. And so that is one of the pivots we are, we are making. The learning grids are developed by our teachers, but when we um, look at, we can see, you know, calendars and we know how many meetings it's taking for those learning teams, those grade level teams to um, devise those learning grids. Um, there is plenty of time in schedules to be doing the Zooms. 
there's always concerns about access and equity. So just to say I'm going to do it at nine o'clock every day can be can be somewhat problematic because every student can't get on at nine o'clock every day. It's similar to the, the problem with lunches, right? How do I do this and that? So, you know, our recommendation is to um, do this um, certainly consistently, but maybe at different times throughout the day. We have, we have again, some great celebrations and stories. We have a, one of our kindergarten teachers who is doing a um, parent Zoom meeting on Sundays to walk them through the grid. So we have lots of, of great celebrations going on and we're hoping to share those out and have our teachers share those out in their PLCs so that they can learn from each other and um, you know, get past the fear and anxiety. They're, they're having that too. Um, you know, there's, there's scheduling for some, they've got their own children at home, but um, we're, we're gonna be encouraging and, um, and pushing to um, work around those, those fee bumps. Does that help? It does, thank you. Any um, other questions on the learning forward timeline slide? Any other comments from learning services or others? I have a question follow up with Deborah. Uh, Deborah, when you ask that question, it makes me um, <clears throat> think about, so I'm, I guess uh, I'm a little bit confused myself as a parent and as a board member of uh, kind of like uh, what is the expectation when we say new learning? Is that are we curating information and new learning that is guided by students and by the parents or are the um, teachers teaching? So I think there is kind of a role and responsibility uh, and or expectation of what parents uh, are asking from the school district. Are we just providing learning materials or are we actually teaching uh, the students? And so I get, um, and to be able to state, make a statement about what is our philosophy during this time, I think would, you know, good or bad, but at least put people on uh, the same understanding. So at this moment, are we, yeah, you know, uh, what is that philosophy right now? Kind of looking at Jamie, because I know she's, she's worked um, really hard on this. Absolutely, teachers are, are teaching. Does it look different than it would look in the brick and mortar classroom? Yes, it, it does. Um, the, some teachers are, if you go on the learning grid, you will see teacher videos where teachers are, are using the video and then the assignment is being posted on Seesaw or Schoology and then teachers are checking on that. Um, uh, again, the, the email that the board saw from a parent regarding the first grade teacher who was uh, being really responsive on Seesaw in as the students were completing work was giving them feedback as to um, how their learning was progressing. So that is absolutely an expectation that our, our teachers are providing that feedback for students and thereby parents as to how um, the students are progressing in the learning in the standards that are each week being um, presented to students depending on their grade level. And I would say to okay. Director Dan, I, I think your question is spot on with, I was just on a call today with um, most of the, all the other learning, teaching and learning directors from across the Puget Sound Educational Service District, so King and Pierce Counties. Um, and everyone is really trying to grapple with the right amount. And what does that look like in terms of um, especially when we start talking about levels. So back to elementary, um, what is the amount of time that, a, that direct instruction can take place versus where it happens more independently? How do you do that in an equitable manner? Because um, not all families, especially, we're running into the issue of, well, I have three, three kids, but if every teacher wants to have a time with the kids at the same time, and we only have two devices or three devices, and there's bandwidth issues, um, no matter the hotspots, so we're trying to figure that out. I wouldn't say that we have it nailed down perfectly. Aaron, maybe you want to shed light on the conversations um, with regard to where we got with the MOU and then maybe our principals weighing in. But I, I certainly can tell you that um, I think that's what we're trying to really hone in on. When I done the research on a lot of online elementary schools just to try to figure out what they're doing, um, you know, they're really clear that it takes a commitment from a parent or guardian at home to be doing, you know, upwards of 80% of the lifting 
and only 20% is with the teachers, that's a lot to put on our parents during this time because many of them um, are trying to save businesses or keep people employed um, and that's making it challenging. But Aaron, um, maybe your perspective on that, the MOU side of things and how you yeah. got where you are. Yeah, so, are. so um, I, first of all, I want to commend MIA leadership. And there were actually a lot of voices at the table when we were discussing what would be the working conditions in this virtual environment. Um, and we got to a place and we really were taking an equity lens because the reality was that we wanted to create a system that would allow those who have other pressures at home or inability to access at a specific time to still be accessing educational content. Because if the only option was to log in at eight o'clock and that's your class from eight to 10, those kids who couldn't do it because either they didn't have support, they were in their own daycare, um, there are multiple kids trying to be managed because just getting them on, we know, is challenging. So it was designed to be a dual process. One, which is a just in time, which is, or a, as the student can access content that is created by the teachers. So teachers are very working very hard to create that content and that content is tailored to the essential learning standards and I'm probably using the wrong term so correct me if I use the wrong term Fred and um, Fred and Jamie and Donna um, but it they are working towards ensuring that the students are meeting those essential learning objectives in the last bit of the year and that all students irrespective of the time they have support or can access material virtually can still access them and that is a form of teaching the teachers are creating that content they are also giving feedback um, on the content because people are uploading I mean if you look at the elementary school they're uploading things through seesaw and they're getting feedback also contemplated knowing that and it even says it in our MOU, relationships are key. The relationships with the teachers that the students have with the teachers and with each other are important. There, is, there are requirements or there's expectations in the MOU, which is mutually agreed upon by both the teachers, the district, everybody's on the same page, right? That we want our students to be connecting with the teachers and to the extent the teachers can facilitate that with each other. What that looks like will vary. It will vary upon the content, um, the level, and the teachers, um, what's best for the students. So I know there are examples in our district of you know, a fabulous third grade teacher. She's ho hosting Zoom meetings for a whole class, right? And that works for her, um, and that works for her class. I know other teachers that are doing small groups um, because that works for them. What I want to emphasize is that we're in our first week of the learning forward um, and that really both the direct um, communication, direct connection with students and the um, like pre-prepared, which is prepared by our teachers, that's both a form of teaching um, and it's both, both essential. Um, and that is a way we create equity. The other thing, if you want to, I know there's been a lot of focus on elementary, is that there is a continuity upon, across buildings and grade levels, and that's really to ensure equity issues um, or to protect against those because it allows our ELL and special education specialists to more readily support students as they access those pre-prepared lessons, those lessons that are prepared in advance by our teachers. Um, and so that was very intentional. So what it looks like um, in terms of your individual experience or your child's individual experiences with a teacher um, will probably look different based on the teacher, but there is a strong expectation and I think desire on behalf of teachers to be connecting with their students um, regularly. And I said, if you look at the MOU, there's languages like, you know, potentially having um, a hybrid of classroom-like instruction twice a week, um, looking at the high school, and then open office hours. But there's also contemplation that it has to be coordinated um, across, um, across sort of the building. And to that, I'm gonna have to turn it over to the principals because they really know what it looks like right now on the ground with their teachers. Um, because that, but I wanted you to know that that was the contemplation and creating the working condition was it was this hybrid model and the reason why it existed was for equity reasons. 
Uh, and I can give a little bit of a building perspective. And I think this is highlighting one of the challenges we've faced already and that we'll continue to face is finding that sweet spot between um, kid directed learning and teacher directed learning. I think we all have a different idea in our minds of what online education should be or the best form of online education. We've heard some parents would like their kids in front of a screen from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, being, being directed by a teacher in their learning. We've heard other parents say, give us packets to do and how kids can do them and we'll check in every so often. And so that's one of the challenges. Even when we do have um, Zoom meetings or Schoology conference meetings, there's a, some parents are saying, and students are saying, we just, we want the social emotional connection. So let's spend a lot of time, some of those get to know, or re reconnecting activities, um, that, that social emotional stuff where other kids and families are saying, we want the academics, give us that academic piece during that time. So as we're going through this, and we're gonna get better as we go, and probably as soon as we get really good, we'll go back to traditional schooling. But I think it, it's gonna be a process of trying to weigh all of these different perspectives and needs from kids. And we all know in a class of 30, or a, a, a set of classes of 150 at a middle or high school, you're gonna have lots of different competing interests and competing needs. So. We're gonna get better as we go. This is just week one. In fact, for IMS, this is kind of a soft start this week, uh, a soft opening, and we'll be really jumping into that next week. But um, it's just trying to find that, thread that needle of what everybody needs, which is virtually gonna be impossible, but it's gonna, it's an aspirational goal that we hope to be able to get to. And can I just jump in here? Because actually, I'm kind of chomping at the bit over here to jump in because I'm I'm actually very very excited about what is coming and what has been rolled out this week and what it's leading to for next week. Um, you know, going back to um, the request for what is required, what can we count on? What's predictable for parents? to expect from classrooms, I think is, a, is something we have heard. And um, we 100% uh, agree on that. Um, but we also need to retain that flexibility for each individual classroom to um, be able to address the unique constellation of student needs, um, family needs. Every one of our teachers in, in a lot of different ways is surveying every parent and every um, family to find out what 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 will work for you what can work for you um, and you know like is to be expected the the um, availability is all over the map for every single classroom and so by you know by the end of this week um, every every classroom at Lake Ridge uh, will have at least attempted these in-person um, Zoom meetings. Some are direct instruction, some are moving to small groups for not just intervention, but also for extension work. Some are doing daily um, kind of social emotional check-ins every morning, where you at? And then following that up with, perhaps there was a Monday um, pre-recorded video on let's say a math, a math standard um, that would, was rolling out on the grid um, and so the teacher checks in the next day with their class are there any questions on that particular lesson so there is a ton of um, just work being being done to add that personal in-person um, connection to the moving the learning forward can you so, briefly describe, can, Heidi, can you just briefly describe for those of us that don't have elementary school kids, um, the grid? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's a Monday through Friday grid. <laughs> and um, each, you know, each column is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then, um, then um, the rows are reading and then reading extensions, writing, writing extensions, um, or optional extensions, I should say, um, math, um, math extensions. <laughs> there's a social emotional learning, our specialists. So every day there's a movement piece 
that's um, included in the um, in the grids that's coming from our PE um, teachers. And, and just keep in mind that this is K-5. So this is, you know, one PE teacher may be planning an activity for, I think they've um, looped them, grouped themselves into grade bands kind of deal. Anyhow, so there's a movement piece. Um, every, uh, at least once a week, they're also getting um, a, a lesson, if you will, inserted into the grid from their other specialists, Spanish, um, music, art, PE. Um, so that's what the grids look like. And then, um, and uh, it, it's pretty fantastic work. I gotta be honest with you. I, I've never in my career witnessed this level of um, kind of consensus work across multiple buildings. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Sometimes it's challenging enough to get consensus across um, two or three teachers at one grade level and to see them working together to identify, okay, what, what are our most essential standards that we need to cover next as a whole guaranteed system for any, any student in our, um, in our classrooms, right? So we've, they're working together to identify those really essential standards and they're following our, our um, our adopted curriculums and scopes and sequences that we already had in place. They're just kind of prioritizing what has to be done um, because we're also trying to limit those grids to um, being less than three hours of work a day for students, realizing, realizing that some students might take three minutes to do a 30 minute, something we planned for 30 minutes, whereas another student might, might need um, a lot of extra time for that. So we're trying to strike that middle ground um, with the grids. Um, teachers are looking at every single, every single thing that goes into those grids for equity. So how can we make this accessible to my student um, with dyslexia? So maybe that, that involves teachers um, reading the text aloud, um, through screencasts or Seesaw and all these other tools. We have um, tools that they are exploring and using um, a lot of speech to text. Um, those kinds of things are happening. Um, when they can't find um, a way to make it more broadly accessible for any student, teachers are making videos of, um, of the, the work. So there's just a lot of phenomenal work going on and we've gotten it to a place where, um, you know, those grids are really um, that guaranteed piece for all students, which is gonna be so important for next year, especially so that we can have some, some idea of what every student got at the end of whatever grade they're in so that we can plan moving forward. But, now that we've got that piece in place, now teachers, every single principal had a, a staff meeting today where they, our number one message was, um, you know, don't be restricted by this. Now you can start going out and differentiating. You can start going out and providing intervention. You are the ones that know your students and your families best. And, and so we <laughs> kind of taking the, we want them to start flexing their instructional individualizing muscles, if you will, <laughs> um, out there. And um, so it's really exciting stuff. The grids as well. Uh, this week, we went, we've started um, identifying what are, the, what are the pieces that we're going to require students to turn in so that we can give them some feedback. And so then teams are deciding, for example, we're gonna have every, fifth grader turn in this constructed response for reading. And then they're also agreeing on a common assessment um, tool to use to give feedback um, on that piece. Uh, they're doing that as uh, district-wide teams. And then in their local teams, they're moving to some calibration work. So now um, say my four teachers at fifth grade might sit down with those constructed responses from students and um, you know, it's, it's not really scoring, but um, provide feedback, score them, grade them, however you want to phrase it. Um, and, you know, you know um, 
calibrate with their neighbor to say, hey, would you give this student the same feedback kind of work? And their, their plan is to get the feedback back to students um, by Monday of the following week. So most of the assignments are kind of due, if you will, by Thursday. Um, right. And that gives teachers time, time to go through and give really authentic, timely feedback to students. So um, there's just a lot of really exciting sure. things coming. Yeah, there's a lot of different pieces. And I think, you know, Heidi, you started to touch on um, sort of what feedback looks like. And as I said, some of the feedback is the just in time or the, the feedback like the person commenting on Seesaw, which just sort of furthers and deepens that connection with the students. But then feedback, I think, looks different depending on whether you're a kindergartner. I'm going to sort of turn it and look a bit to Vicki of what does feedback look at look like at the secondary level and maybe um, Aaron Miller like feedback will change um, changes depending on the the needs of the students and where they're at. So this is Vicki at the high school. Um, Megana and Paul feel free to jump in. I'm so excited to see you guys. Um, first of all we miss our students dearly. This, the teachers do and definitely I do and the rest of the admin team and the counseling team, we just totally miss our kids a lot. Um, in fact, one of the, the, the kids, I guess this group was kind of bored. They did this bingo game and guess who's the free spot on the bingo game. They decided to make my picture the, the free spot. So that's, I, I, just, I just love our students and I miss them. But a couple of examples that I wanna give about continuous learning. Um, so at the high school, um, we have, embarked this week on the you need to be back in school and Megan and Paul I really want to thank you both because we were so worried last week about kids engaging and we were nervous about okay are they going to show up to the to their to their sessions and um, we had uh, a, quite a few 100 percent attendances in in, in uh, engaging and we had uh, today we had like 98 97 percent uh, of our school so when when you look at uh, the grid that um, Jamie Prescott talked about earlier, or maybe it was in, I don't remember who it was, um, that we're tracking the online presence of Schoology. Uh, we have only, you know, with 1,560 students, we have about 1,500 of them that are, that are engaged, at least um, by the hash marks we see on Schoology. So we've had really good um, participation, and I really want to give Megan and Paul the credit for that because they reached out they reached out on their own to Donna and I and said look what can we do to help and I said what you can do to help is get these guys engaged get these kids to the to the mark this week and congratulations to the two of you because you did and we have we have really good participation um, but one of the examples is our teachers are recognizing that students really want to have time to engage with each other a little bit um, before they kind of start class. So a couple of teachers that I talked to, one gave me a really good example. She'd gotten online early because she was wanting to make sure that everything worked for Zoom and that, that her class was going to be ready to go. And she gets online and she got online 15 minutes early thinking that it was just going to be herself. And it was most of her class. They were there, they were ready, they were ready for her to punch them in and um, accept them in. And so she gave them the first 10, 15 minutes of their session, just chatting it up. And she said it was so wonderful because um, kids were really excited to be back in, in some type of learning again with each other and with her. And um, it just gave a totally different energy to, um, to, the, to the learning. I think the other thing that I wanted to mention um, is that um, on assessment and, and, and just thinking about, as you know, the high school is really struggling um, because we are waiting for direction from OSPI about grading and what that does that look like in assessment. And it has caused some anxiety with our students, but also our parents and our staff. So all three groups and administration, we are definitely wanting to know and, and, and get a sense of direction from OSPI about that. And so what I have shared with staff is that um, I want them to move forward with grading like they, that, like they have been um, setting up so that they have a sense of where students are. Um, one of the things that we talked about today in our staff cabinet meeting was the feedback that we're getting from students and Megan and Paul jump in anytime if you wanna, wanna share, um, is that they're getting slammed with a lot of work and didn't re and I think people were 
worried about not giving them enough work to to work on and so then their students were saying wow i think i'm working harder than i ever was um and um so um we are trying to balance our schedule of due dates of things so that kids aren't getting things required to be due at the same time and how we're we're adjusting that um is we're looking at you know each teacher is assigned a class period per per day and that they make it due during their class period on that set day rather than everything on Fridays and making assessments all on Fridays. And so, um, so we are looking at those kinds of exam those kinds of things um, to try to make some adjustments. We are going to run our schedule for um, the next two weeks and then on the third week we're going to use that as a reflection time we're going to be asking students and parents and staff for feedback about that schedule um, right now we have the class periods um, we've set up class periods in that fashion so that we didn't have students competing teachers competing for the same student um, to to invite them to a session that was something that paul you and megana had shared a little bit about that concern and so that was one of the reasons why our class so kids go to two class periods per per day and what we mean by that is they're in two hour segments but the but the idea is a teacher may choose to meet with their students or they may choose to do small groups or they may, may choose to do a combination so um megan and paul did you guys want to kind of chime in on anything there just from a student perspective uh, yeah, I can talk a little bit about like the schedule and how it's kind of worked out. So uh, a, lo a lot of the teachers, I mean, honestly, like, like I've, I've, I've enjoyed it so far. I enjoy like the two hour uh, sections. Um, I'm trying to think about that. I kind of I kind of lost my train of thought. I, I knew I was going to say it first, but um, I, so far I've heard a lot of good things about the schedule itself. And then, uh, but I have heard the concern about uh, just kind of getting slammed by homework. I feel like the the one thing is teachers kind of find it hard to use that two hour time to actually le lecture and teach new content. So it's kind of like making it's you have to find the balance of like use the, the two hours effectively because sometimes teachers like give work and then uh, have like Q and A kids ask questions and stuff. But I honestly think like the two hour schedule will work pretty well. It, like as long as teachers kind of make the best use of it. Uh, but then I have heard, I mean, with the, the grading concerns with the pass fail versus uh, grades itself, I mean, that's honestly like all the questions that the students are asking, they really want to know. And it, it's kind of difficult because you kind of need to, it's, it's a difficult decision for like the district and we're, like obviously we're waiting for uh, information from OSPI. And, like I've gotten so many students asking me and trying to tell me like, to influence the, te the the teachers and everything like to uh, one way or the other. But um, I, I don't mean to cut you off, Paul, but we are going to actually talk about grading and where we're going on a, on a decision for that because we're hearing those same concerns. It is in yeah. one of the slides coming up where we're going to talk about the timeline. Um, we haven't completely made that decision yet, but Dr. Reynolds has been doing a lot of work on that. So we're going to be able to give more information um, on the grading that is actually one of the slides here so we don't want to get off kilter too much um, President Lurie is would you like us to move forward now or anywhere so I just I think timeline so uh, so I've been directed that we have 13 more slides and we're at six o'clock and we're scheduled till 6 30 so um, I think uh, I know that the middle school is really ramping up with their trimester next week. Um, so if we could just get like a one minute summary from Aaron and then and then keep moving forward. Does that sound good? Yeah, I can I can, I can be brief. Um, it's one of the skills I have. Um, so we are, we are ramping up next week. Our office hours, we've done a little bit different. We've done um, two kind of 45 minute sessions per class, one um, per week, one in the morning, one in the afternoon for each class. Um, we, I, I think once again, my comments before about trying to find the sweet spot about how to use that time. Um, we, we imagine it being a blend of Q and A, but also some instruction uh, that happens, but we'll see how it goes in the first couple of weeks. Once again, um, that social emotional piece is important. So I could see a lot of our teachers spending the first 10, 15 minutes doing some check-ins with kids how's it going let kids talk to each other because the kids miss the teachers 
and that connection, they also miss each other. And so that's important. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, I, I'm hopeful, I'm excited. Uh, like Heidi, I think there's lots of, of excitement coming into it, lots of apprehension. I think it's new for everyone, but um, we'll start with that schedule next week. We've also done it where it's specific periods so kids aren't having to choose which class they go to. Um, that's a change for us based on parent feedback. So um, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, the 20th is the mandatory piece. We've had even not being mandatory these last couple of days, we've had over 90% of our kids check in on Schoology and complete uh, tasks. So we think we're, we're rolling towards the right direction. So we're excited about that. I'm, I've got a concern in terms of learning forward. Um, we've been behind uh, a little bit in terms of predicting where this is going. And I'll kind of make a statement here that says in Jan September to January 2021, uh, we will probably be doing online learning of some sort in that time frame too. It's uh, highly unlikely that we'll be able to fully congregate inside schools. And about the best prediction I could make right now would be 20% of the kids show up on Monday, another 20% show up on Tuesday uh, through Friday. And that kind of suggests that we need to think about, especially in the middle and high school level, where, what we, where we aspirationally want to be. I appreciate there are lots of, we're, we're kind of mired in transition right now as we embrace online learning and a lot of the turmoil is this transition period. I mean, from a board level also, we're concerned about where we're going to be over the long term. And it feels like that's going to be more online learning and continuing in September and January, colleges are already planning for that. Uh, you know, and even freshman year being uh, online and we should be thinking about that too. So how do we do, you know, probably in 8.30 to 3 p.m. high school class in September where every, every class is online and how, what does that look like? We've got a bargain coming in front of us uh, for August where we have to think about uh, what that looks like as well. Um, if we have any new scheduling requirements, how do we handle the scheduling of these classes and how many teachers per student and all that, uh, how many students per teacher and all that type of thing needs to come into play. So I think we're, we've got a lot of in transition questions around being very accommodating to different parent styles and so there's, there's a, a lot more movement than we really have in our brick and mortar buildings today. We, we've got a very structured day in our brick and mortar buildings and we should have a structured day online. And it feels like we, we don't have those aspirations yet. Uh, whereas I do hear that coming from other districts and I do hear that coming from colleges as to where they want to be, um, you know, actually even in next month in terms of a full day of school. So that's all I have to say, thank you. So um, David, I, I'm hoping that we will answer um, some of your, your questions and your statements because we agree um, we are in, in transition right now, but as we look towards um, what comes next, that future readiness, we do need to contemplate um, what's going to happen next or how do we um, how do we work through school until there is a vaccine that eases some of the fears so um, we don't have a, a, a lot of that tonight but I will be able to share some but hopefully before we're we're done as to what our plans are for that future readiness thinking so Fred would you like to move to um, the next slide um, and then tackle the um, preparing our students for their future when it comes to the, the graduation in higher ed. Absolutely. Um, Jamie, you want to kick it off and then I'll, I'll come in right behind you on that? Sure. So one of the things that we've heard from families and, you know, they're stressed about 
um, their students and where their students are in their learning. And there's this sense of feeling that students are behind and that this, our students are falling behind. And the reality is um, we're really neither ahead nor behind. Um, you know, everybody is in this same boat and we're all trying to um, look and see where we are and where we need to get. And so um, I, I wanna make sure that we understand collectively that we're not falling behind, we're all facing these same challenges. And so we're all trying to figure out what the essential pieces are and where we're, gonna, where we're going. And so um, with that, I think Fred's gonna talk a little bit about where we're headed for 2021 and what we've learned along the way um, that will help guide us through that process. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to begin wherever we begin and to Director D'Souza's point, um, whether or not that is continuing in a, a hybrid manner or an online manner or back in the schools, it, 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 it really is going to come down to wherever we're picking up at the end of this year, we're going to have to continue forward next year. And learning is a continuum. Um, we've definitely built this very structured, highly agrarian uh, calendar minded system where we're moving from one grade to the next. And so I appreciate um, and understand where parents are coming from as a parent myself. Hey, you know, is my third grader going to be ready for fourth grader in the case of one of my children in my own house? Um, and I think we have to shift our mindset a little bit. To realize that it's not about next grade, it's going to be about ready for, being ready for the next learning standard. Um, and so that's what uh, Heidi was talking about in terms of unpacking those standards and really looking at it and then taking into account that we've got to mine this opportunity gap that is undoubtedly being created, not just within Mercer Island, but across all of our systems now. And what about the students that don't have as much as the same touch points or they're taking care of family members at home and they're not able to engage how can we make sure that we work with them? And then lastly, we just put this section on there about making sure that we don't forget what we've been learning from Parent Edge. Um, that group has had, has had a very sharp focus in the last six years or so around the mental health and the stress and the anxiety of our students. Um, they're going to be feeling it perhaps now more than ever in terms of what does this you don't want to add to that and you know I, I just listed some of the the groups that we've had or the topics that we've had there um, with unselfie of why empathetic kids survive in this all about me world um, we have a great opportunity to teach uh, empathy right now um, talking about kids and race and thinking about um, why is it that certain pop populations um, and in our community seem to be suffering more from this um, than others and zip codes are different. And then lastly, it's that race to nowhere. Um, I think it goes back to where are we all headed? And that will be some of the heavy lifting that we're gonna have to do as a community to determine, you know, wh where are we all headed? Because if we're just racing and racing and trying to keep up or go forward, I think we're gonna miss out on those opportunities to really make a lasting change on public education and make it better for our students. Um, and dreams, you can advance. Something we've been thinking about and it, it will feed into our grading conversation is really you know, preparing students for their future. And you as a board, um, uh, this, this when you were grappling with language, those of you who were on the board at the time last year uh, and really finally settled in on this, it's preparing them for their um, but we also know that their future is shaped by a number of external factors. And so um, we won't go through the, the hyperlinks, but the, they are, each of these is hyperlinked uh, to different information about, you know, what's the future of the SAT and ACT and the number of colleges that are just scrapping it all together and making it optional or not even um, having students submit it. Thinking about admissions to Washington schools, they've started coming out talking about um, waiving certain uh, requirements, understanding that students might have a pass instead of a letter grade. Um, another statement by our Washington schools around just the whole idea of the admissions process. The UC schools seem to be much more um, unified and together in, than our Washington schools, and they've come out with a very cohesive statement or series of statements. 
Um, but we also have to think about the NCAA and our students who are athletes who might be participating in athletics next fall if they're able to um, have athletics at their colleges. Um, how is the NCAA going to interpret transcripts? Because a P um, historically has been treated as a D. to do no harm to our students. Um, so we're, we're considering all of these as we're preparing them for their future. Um, and the landscape continues to change, but ultimately they're our priority and we have to make decisions that are gonna be in the best interests of the Meganas of the world um, and, and her colleagues who are seniors. So this leads to the next slide, which is about grades, which we, we did reference a little bit. So um, Fred, could you um, run through this? We know it is of course um, front and center of the minds, particularly of our high school students. Yep, so our, our kindergarten to eighth grade, um, you know, our, our starting with kind of K-5, we will stick with our standards-based grading. It really is at the end. Um, it's about, you know, as a student, right on um, proficiency, are they slightly below proficiency or advanced? And um, there, we, have, we see no reason. We have some middle school classes that have embraced that as well this year. And for the ones who haven't, Aaron and Mary Jo and Weston and myself and others, teacher leaders have been talking about um, kind of that um, proficient, not proficient, or pass, not proficient idea. Um, so the real conversation that we've had, and, and Principal Puckett um, alluded to it, is what will the grading look like for our high schoolers and those middle school classes that are credit-bearing? Um, we are getting lots of input. We understand that OSPI had a task force meeting on the 14th, um, so just uh, two days ago. We are expecting guidance either tonight or tomorrow morning. I don't believe they're going to tell us what to do, but I think they're going to provide some boundaries. We know we've got some school districts in our area that are considering some pretty um, interesting models. Seattle had just shared you know, their model of what they're going to do. Highline has a different one. Federal Way has a different one than them, and Auburn's still a different um, one after that. So um, what we want to do is make sure that we are equitable in the way that we are um, going to be evaluating student work and provide and having them earn scores. Um, that it's accessible and that it's not going to penalize our students either this year or in the future. So it's not so much our seniors now, um, but we're really thinking about those juniors, sophomores, freshmen, and eighth graders taking some of theirs. So our goal is to make a decision by next Friday. We set that timeline for ourselves several weeks ago. That was the original timeline of when schools were going to reopen. Um, and so we're going to push for that to be our date that we make a decision by, if not before. Um, and we'll certainly be updating you through our superintendent. Any questions on the grading piece? Definitely more, more to come. We are, uh, there was a lot of moving parts. And certainly for our high schools, it's, it's much more complex for our high schoolers. And looking at all the different parts and pieces, as, as Fred mentioned, is absolutely critical to make sure that we're giving kids um, access and not um, putting up barriers and on-ramps that they'll still have access to. Um, one question as far as board work goes, because I assume that the board, I mean, this is unprecedented times, but I assume the board needs to approve whatever the leadership team brings us because it's grading standards. So your, the policy doesn't um, contemplate that. Okay. It's um, either as an A or a P. You probably all received some information from WASDA regarding um, waivers. And I believe we have that in, an, in another slide um, further on. So we'll, we'll address when, that. When you say A or P, do you mean letter grade or pass? Oh. No, she's meaning uh, uh, administrative policy or a board okay, policy. Okay, okay, gotcha. All right, so I, I just didn't want to have you guys do all the work and then bring it to us on something that we have to approve and then, you know, do armchair quarterbacking at the end. So that that that's my concern, and if that's not happening, then great. I think the the in a situation like this, the influence has been you and your one-on-ones with Donna or your interactions with her. You're providing input. 
we certainly make a recommendation to Donna on this because she ultimately is the superintendent will kind of have the sign off, but um, it's the high school team, um, the middle school team, myself um, and teacher leaders who are trying to put together what the right model will be. Um, so your influence is really through, through Donna. The policy wise, there's not a specific policy that outlines um, the specific grades and how they will be assigned. Okay. There is um, some graduation piece, and that's what I was referencing that we're going to talk gotcha. about. And just just for context, it does involve about there's about 350 uh, middle schoolers that do have the opportunity to receive a high school credit in middle school based on algebra, geometry, or eighth grade world language. So we definitely have been involved in the conversation. We plan on those classes to follow whatever the recommendation of the high school is for those uh, credit bearing classes. And our middle schoolers can always take a P anyway on any of their high school level classes in middle school. So they have that option already anyway. Um, so um, on the next slide is really about attendance um, and thinking about, you know, how are we accounting for our students? And in our case, it's not so much about the students that I mean, it is all about them from a teaching and learning, but our focus in terms of attendance is who's not showing up to class, who's not checking in at all. Um, and those are the students who we're most concerned with. Our kindergarten to fifth grade are gonna be um, keeping track of um, who are they checking in with and meeting with and who's showing up to Zoom meetings or emailing from parents, hey, we're working on this, but we can't make the Zoom meetings, um, checking in there. For our high school and our middle school, um, I think we've come up with a really interesting solution um, and that is we're going to have a weekly attendance uh, grade, if you will, or a score. And it's going to be based on not just attendance, but, but engagement. And so thinking about a, a rubric and a model that's a three, two, and one, similar to a standards-based. And the three is a student is attending and engaging, which means they have a presence on Schoology. They're participating in the class sessions or they're emailing with their teachers. They're checking in during um, office hours. They're, make, they're turning in assignments. A two is they're attending and engaging, but it requires prompting. The teacher's having to reach out, hey, we didn't see you today, or we need those assignments. Um, from this student and engagement, in which case then, we're already talking about our interventions using our absentee coordinator um, and others as well. Am I breaking up a little bit or am you I doing all right? Dead. Okay, sorry, I'll go back to my hot spot. Take it away. <laughs> Um, just and just to remind the board, our um, in in terms of budget allocations, this year is different because of what's occurred. Our um, enrollment and attendance um, budget allocations for the remainder of this school year will be based on those March enrollment numbers that when we were still in school. So we have been assured. Superintendents have been re repeatedly assured by the state superintendent that those allocations aren't going to change. They do not expect us to be doing a period or a daily attendance marking as we are usually required to do. So that is something that is um, changed for the rest of this year. It's really just about engaging our families. And to uh, Director D'Souza's point earlier is, is that something that we anticipate looking different as we move forward in the future to a, um, a model that looks different than it is now, but potentially a blended model? Um, those are factors that we're going to have to continue to um, ask questions about and learn about um, as OSPI makes adjustments as well. Next, we want the other to oh, sorry, David. Sorry, the other thing to think about on the attendance is I mean, if we've got 90% plus attendance by kids right now, they're, I think I view it as kids are giving this opportunity the benefit of the doubt and are uh, engaged and present to the, to the degree that they find this worthwhile uh, use of their time, they will continue to attend. I think, if they, you know, if we don't make, and my concern is if we don't make this worthwhile, um, we're wishy-washy on grading or accountability or homework or things like that, kids will naturally drop off. I also appreciate that there is a problem with everyone being available at a certain time. And uh, other school districts do take advantage of 
uh, Zoom being able to record. Uh, and then the students who couldn't make it during the regularly scheduled time could view the recordings and get equivalent credit for attending by viewing the recording. And then those recordings have to be viewed within a certain number of days and they're deleted after that to protect against other issues that may come up. But that kind of allows both ways to, to work and attendance is, is checked off as present, whether you did it in real time or uh, viewed a recording. Thank you for um, that insight. We're going to talk about technology a little bit here on a couple of slides. So that will be a, a great place for um, us to consider that, um, that feedback. We did want to talk a little bit with you about um, special services. We know that there's a lot of questions around this. And I'm hoping that Dr. Booby is still um, on with us and could maybe talk through um, this next slide, slide 11, about special services and the work that she and our assistant director have been engaged in with our special ed teachers and our other educational support um, specialists. Sue Ann? Yes, hi. Um, so um, before spring break, our um, case managers and um, related service professionals um, engaged in creating individualized continuity of learning plans with e for every family uh, that receives special services. Um, those continu continuity of learning plans um, are assisting students in accessing the um, new reality of what general education curriculum looks like. Um, our SPED teachers, our SLPs, OTs, PTs, our school sites are all supporting the general education staff and they're meeting with students. Sometimes individually, sometimes in groups, sometimes um, not really one-on-one. -on -one. There's usually a second adult um, available, but they are um, providing scribe services or tutoring services or one-on-one -on -one support for individually designed instruction. Um, and they're also, um, especially at the elementary level, there's a SPED representative on every grade level team. So um, everyone is working together to make sure that uh, we keep equity and access in the forefront of our, our discussions. Uh, we are conducting IEP meetings um, as per our timelines. We actually started our official timelines back on Monday. As new learning starts, the timeline started. We're conducting evaluations if possible. There's quite a few pieces of evaluations that have to be conducted in person, otherwise it invalidates the results. So we're working individually with families um, to conduct the ones that we can. We also are aware that some students might have different behaviors when they return to a brick and mortar school and we don't want to create a plan based on one set of circumstances knowing that it's gonna change um, once we get back. So um, we're doing what we can with that. Um, so that's moving forward. We're also um, working very hard. I need to give a shout out, shout out to Hannah Bolivar uh, and Ann Reeves who are really working together and, and Tony Kuhn and getting all of our assistive tech equipment out to our students with disabilities. So we did an initial round. Um, and then once new learning started, we needed to make sure we got out our adaptive keyboards, our jelly bean switches for communication. Some students didn't have all their hearing pieces that they needed for their um, hearing aids. Um, students not, might need walkers or they might want to borrow an adaptive tricycle or need a different type of seat to help the student during the day. So all that equipment is being cleaned and distributed now. So um, it's quite a team effort across the district, but we're making sure that any parent that needs an assistive uh, piece of equipment is getting what they, they've requested. And I want to jump in here uh, really quickly because it is quite a process and we actually have guidance um, that our school nurses um, are working with us on through public health as to how we can distribute these um, pieces of equipment and other items from the schools. How do we get them back to families? It's quite a process. We have to make sure they're clean. We have to make sure they sit for a long enough time. Of course, all physical distancing when we're distributing them. So it's... Um, a, much more complex in, in these curtain, certain health crisis time than just saying, come and pick it up. Additional, serv oh, I'm sorry, 
before we move on, are there any questions for Sue Ann regarding um, the special education and the um, yes services? I have a question. And apologies for turning my video off for a minute. I'm providing first aid for my kid who wiped out on her bike. Not my bike. <laughs> oh, sorry. That was wagon. Okay, wiped out on a wagon. Um, my question is just this um, to Sue Ann: Is what 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 if anything are you able to do for students who normally share equipment at school? You know, like some of the I know you had talked before about some of the bigger items like machines and things like readers, that kind of thing. Uh, sorry, my husband was trying to deliver my dinner. Oh, um, did you hear? Yes, I heard your question. Um, so, um, so far, um, we have enough equipment to go around and we haven't had, to, we haven't had that issue at the moment. Okay. Um, we do have a, a few, but not very many uh, of the students opting out of any assistance at this time, but uh, we continue to touch base with those families to make sure they haven't changed their mind and they have everything they need. That's um, great. But yeah, so far I haven't run into that. We are, um, we've done really well equipping our students um, in the equipment that they do use. This just shows that they use it all the time. So we've purchased enough equipment over the years to make sure every student has access throughout the day and they're not having to wait for someone else to get off a tricycle or a walker for them to access what they need. Any other questions around special services? What are the policies regarding like breakage of the equipment and lossage and things? I, I hope we're, we're lenient with that type of stuff and we've got the right protections around it for the school district as well. Yes, we yeah. do. And um, we're using the same um, type of forms that we use when we send out the iPads. Um, so the parents um, have to um, agree to the same type of safety things. But they're also, for some of the specialized equipment, we're providing some um, Zoom trainings to parents before we let them get the equipment. So if they've never used a walker with their child, we want to make sure they understand all the safety features on a walker or an adaptive tricycle um, before we hand it over. Um, so we are working on that as well so that our, um, our therapists are touching base and make sure parents are comfortable with the equipment because we don't want them to have a piece of equipment that they've not used and are not comfortable with using. Any other questions for special services? I do just want to jump in and acknowledge it is now 630 and I understand, I mean, this is what we're scheduled for. I, I don't want to stop if, if people are okay with continuing, um, but I do want to remind um, board directors, um, as far as questions go, we do have a board meeting next week and we can continue the dialogue or questions. I mean, I'm not saying no more questions, but they can also be addressed um, directly with Donna um, after the meeting too. So just keep that in mind when you're choosing what questions to ask. So moving um, through the next piece, I know there was some questions about additional services for our, our students who are English language learners, our students who receive um, learning supports, and then of course our counselors and our um, YFS counselors. I, I think Nova, I can't see everyone, I apologize. I believe Nova is here, but if not, then Fred, would you mind jumping in? I am here. You're just going to have to excuse the um, added participant here. <laughs> um, so our ELL teachers and our learning support teachers have been meeting over the course of the closure in an effort to try to find um, the best mechanism to support kids. And part of what we've been talking a lot about is just that if teachers are doing Zoom meetings with kids, then that also limits the opportunities for our LSP and ELL teachers to meet with kids. So we're trying to figure out what does that look like? So they are both um, have been supporting the grids at the moment. And that's the, um, that's the current structure that we're, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so that's the current structure that they're using. However, going forward into next week um, for learning support in particular, the teachers are going to be reaching out to schedule live Zoom meetings with kids. And next week is really gonna be about just kind of um, checking in with kids, see how I, seeing how they're doing, seeing what things they've been doing over the course of the closure, and then start setting up kind of norms and protocols for how they'll behave during 
their sessions with the teachers. And they'll be doing some live instruction, phonics instruction in particular, to try to get kids um, moving along for growth. The state and federal governments have not yet said that they will um, waive the requirements around data collection for a title and lap. So we're proceeding as though we have to record it as per usual, uh, which is actually a good thing because that's also what's best for kids. So that's our current plan. And then our EL teachers are taking a slightly different approach, though similar. They plan to also meet with kids, but what they're doing is reaching out to our EL families to see what particular supports they need because it looks a little different in EL. Um, one of those things, for example, might just be oral language practice so that they can practice with a, a, a first language or first English language speaker. Um, and so that's part of what they're doing is just reaching out to families, finding out what they need and what supports would be most effective for their kiddos. Any quick questions? The language lines refer to our, our parents being able to um, get translation for their questions. All right, Andrews, I believe um, you are up to give us a, a quick um, update on where we are with all of the technology. Um, we have always glitches. Technology is wonderful when it works perfectly, but nothing is, of course, not perfect. We've had Fred cutting out on us tonight. I am actually, as you can probably see, here in the office because my internet um, keeps telling me I'm unstable. Um, and we also had a, a hiccup today with our iPads that um, Andrew's included you as board directors on um, that we've been able to, to rectify, but those are all the, the things that our tech department is, um, all the moving parts that they're constantly working with. So Andrew, go ahead and talk to us about slide 13. So for our technology department, our main focus has just been supporting teaching and learning and making sure that families have the um, devices and internet access that they need in order to access these online curriculum resources, supporting our teachers, in getting ramped up so that they can provide that direct instruction and then also helping with the communication out to our families on how um, they can access those, those online resources. So really quick here, um, so far we've distributed 400 plus iPads and 20 hotspots to our uh, K-5 families. We do have um, more hotspots coming in this week. Um, and so for those families that haven't had an opportunity to pick up a hotspot yet, uh, we are working on getting more of those devices to be able to provide to families. But we saw a very large uptick in the number of families requesting iPads this week as we move towards um, required participation, required attendance, um, and really sort of ramping that up. We actually um, distributed about 200 iPads this Wednesday. Um, and for those families that might be tuning in um, that submitted their request either on Tuesday um, or since then and have not heard back from me, because we had such a large uh, number of requests, we did have to do a cutoff. And so I'll be reaching back out to those families that have submitted requests um, Tuesday or Wednesday or today uh, to set up the next opportunity to, to distribute those devices. Our weekly learning plans, um, based on feedback from our parent community, we are now posting those every Friday at 4 p.m. to give parents an opportunity to be able to see um, what's coming up for the week ahead and prepare that as they're also trying to balance um, those Monday morning meetings and various things like that. Um, we're continuing to advertise that students and parents um, can request assistance by emailing us at the elem.techs at mercerislandschools.org. We have a, a team of instructional tech coaches, technology specialists, the network engineer, myself, um, that monitors that. Um, and we're responding to families as quickly as possible to help resolve any issues that they may be experiencing. Um, and then our teachers are communicating with families through through Seesaw, through Google Classroom, through email, um, and we're seeing a lot more of our Zoom conferencing as we move more towards direct instruction. For our middle school and high school students, um, we have separate email addresses that they can email. It's ims.text at mercerlandschools.org and hs.text. And again, those go to the instructional tech coaches for those levels, the technology specialists for those levels, the network engineer and myself. And so it's a team that's able to help um, respond as quickly as possible to make sure that we're resolving issues. Um, and for our 612 users, uh, our students, our teachers are communicating primarily through Schoology, email, and Zoom. Um, so we really are trying to help 
families by limiting the number of different platforms that our teachers are using to communicate so that it's easier for them as they have six to seven teachers that they may be you know, receiving instruction and, and resources from, um, making it simpler so that they can receive all those in a single spot. Um, in addition, um, we have had some, some families raise some concerns around Zoom and maybe some of what they've been hearing in the news. And so I wanna take this opportunity to just reiterate that the accounts that we receive are um, through OSPI. Um, we actually received these accounts several years ago. All K-20 school districts in the state of Washington um, receive access to educational pro accounts through Zoom. And the privacy policy with those educational accounts is different than what you would see with a free and basic account in Zoom. Um, those privacy policies um, comply with both FERPA and COPA, and they add some additional controls that allows um, teachers to help monitor their um, classroom sessions. For example, that gives them the ability to have that waiting room so that they can admit people in. It gives them the ability to quickly remove participants. As you saw at the beginning of this meeting, um, it allows them to prevent um, participants from sharing their screens or starting their video to help limit distractions. And it provides a, a variety of different features and functionality to help protect those classroom environments. Um, and we've also, as Donna mentioned, um, been providing videos and resources and help guides um, to help teachers um, ramp up to kind of using this online platform. And we're continuing to learn every day. And there's new things that are you know, happening. Zoom's adding additional functionality and features. Um, and so we're continuing to evolve and learn from this process um, to figure out how we can best support our students um, through this remote uh, distance learning model. In regards to requesting technology, if families still um, would like an opportunity to request an iPad or a mobile hotspot, um, right on our website on that COVID-19 resources is um, a link to our form that is um, available all the time. And I've been, um, I think we've actually distributed iPads and hotspots about six times so far since schools have been closed. And that's a process that I'm hoping to be able to continue um, to offer as, as frequently as possible, as long as we can continue to do it in a safe manner. Thank you, Andres. Any quick questions? Um, Director D'Souza, so this, this, um, the feedback you gave us about the Zoom and the recording, we are absolutely taking that and hearing that and we'll, we'll research it and see how that um, could potentially facilitate um, our students' learning. So thank you for that. Um, this next piece, if we want to go to the next slide, Andrews, I need to give um, full credit to our learning services team for um, coming up with this concept of we know how much we have tried to communicate and we get the range of you're communicating not enough, you're communicating way too much, I'm overwhelmed. And so we are constantly looking for ways to differentiate our communication and support for our families. And so um, our learning services team has come up with this suggestion of fireside chats. Fred, would you like to um, describe this for us? See there? I'm here. I'm gonna turn it over to Beth because she was one who was really driving this with our whole team. Um, Beth DeGrace is our assistant director of special services. I think she's still on the call, Beth. Yep, I'm here. There we go. Thank you. So um, yes, so as Donna said, learning services, we, we have our meetings, our weekly meetings. And as we were talking about um, the learning grids and things like that, what ended up popping up a lot was, oh my, families might need information on behavioral supports at the home. Oh my goodness, they need to know what a daily structure schedule kind of um, looks like in the home. Um, mental health supports, technology management, um, and then um, one of the other ideas we talked about was COVID-19 and college admissions. So a lot of things were popping up. It was just, how, do parents know, do guardians know that, you know, you could structure a day, you know, in such, such ways. So um, unprecedented times call for unprecedented measures. So it's a creative way to reach out to families share with them our knowledge um, in the education realm um, and how we can support you in these ideas at home. 
Um, and the idea is that we will um, we will record our we will record the the sessions, and then for this is the initial idea for you to watch before we have a Zoom hosted webinar, maybe like a a, a question answer kind of thing. So. That is the idea that we would record them in advance so that you can watch them because you might need a video of a certain topic um, before it's actually scheduled to have a Q and A. So um, that is the idea. It's going to be scheduled over the next weeks and months. So we'll get that information to you as it comes up. Um, that is it's a little bit about the fireside chats. Are there any questions on the fireside chats? Unmute. Yeah, I just, it's Maggie Ty. I just wanted to say um, thank you. I think this is a super idea and I'm really happy to see the kind of like communications pipeline between the district and families kind of widening out. Like we're getting so much good feedback now from teachers and from parents to teachers and like from the PTA council yesterday on behalf of parents. Like it's great to have a lot of information going both both ways, and I think I think the topic of behavior supports at home and also technology management at home are certainly like top of my mind right now as a parent of an elementary school kid. <laughs> so I'll, I'll really welcome these when they when they come along. Um, also, just just to uh, and I know this needs to be quick. Um, just to chime in on on the last couple of slides um, from Andrea, is that that um, as a parent, I was really frustrated myself on Monday of this week, trying to log into all these sites and figure out what my kid was supposed to be doing from the grid. And I was just about pulling my hair out. And I, I got a great tip from a fellow parent, which was to go on the night before and to look at the next day's grid and see like if there's any materials your kids need, you know, print out anything you need to print out, kind of get it all lined up. And I do it now with my kid the evening before. And it's actually a really nice end of the day kind of winding down thing to do. And then I actually, she's in first grade, right? So I actually have two different browser windows open for her, like Chrome for email and Seesaw. And then I have everything else for school bookmarked on like a Safari browser. And that way she doesn't get confused about where stuff is. And then in the morning when I'm the busiest, I can open like all the tabs that she's gonna need and she just goes from left to right. And then when she's done with the tab, she can close it. So that's my, something I've learned this week that has helped me keep my sanity. <laughs> and I really look forward to hearing what um, everyone has to share at these fireside chats. So thank you. Definitely more to come on the fire fireside chats. We do have a couple other pieces that we wanted to address with you. The next one is, graduation. We get a lot of questions about this. We got two components here when we talk about graduation. The first one is um, certainly about um, finding ways to honor our students. And um, we, Vicki, are you still available to give us a, a brief update on where um, the high school is with our celebrations for graduation conversation? Yes. Uh, so, Next week, um, we have had a graduation committee all year that was focused on some of the concerns that students had about what they could put on their gowns and, and whatnot. Well, since this whole virus has hit, it, the focus has switched. Um, and now we're gonna be looking at what is our graduation going to look like? And so on that committee, we have two administrators. Uh, Jenny Foster is kind of heading that committee. Um, we have seven, um, uh, students and we have um, several parents on the committee and we have seven staff members. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty good sized committee of about 21 people. One of the things we are going to do is we are going to make sure that, that um, every senior gets to weigh in if they wish to um, about ideas that they would have about their virtual graduation or about the graduation. And also we wanna make sure that our parents get an opportunity to weigh in. Um, and we, we've got several parents on the committee already, but we wanna make sure that any parent that wants to weigh in is a senior parent, and then also our staff. So that's gonna get started next week. And uh, we're gonna be looking at a variety of things. We ha do have to keep in mind that we've got to, to make sure that we keep our students safe and their families safe in any kind of a situation that we're setting up and follow the guidelines of the CDC. 
um, I've been in contact with um, um, the principals all across the state and actually I'm also on a national committee so I've been in contact with principals across the nation and 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 been in different meetings and there's a variety of um, ideas that are floating around but um, we also have health departments weighing in on some of those ideas because it's going to depend on um, what's going to happen in terms of um, the uh, rules and regs around just safety uh, with this virus so more to come but we just want you to know that um, our first goal was this week was just to get our school back up and running and learning going and getting our teachers and students engaged again and then next week we are going to start focusing on um, our seniors and um, and and making sure that we send them out with um, you know bells and whistles in 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 the, in, in the ways that we can to support them in um, that next level that they move to thank you and, and I know that our PTA council has already um, decided that they want to move forward with their awards and scholarships and grad grams are still going to um, go out to our seniors. So watch for more information on those traditions, trying to um, sustain as many of our current traditions and potentially build some new ones as we celebrate our seniors. Fred's going to talk to you a little bit about um, where we are in the situation for making sure that every one of our seniors in, in this um, very disruptive time has um, the ability to graduate. So Fred, would you like to update us on that, please? Sure. Um, reflected in OSPI and the State Board of Ed, as well as a um, um, uh, publication you received as a school board from WASDA this week, I think it was called the graduation toolkit. Um, there are a, a few things that we're working on that really have to do with making sure that we can graduate all of our seniors. Um, first and foremost, uh, the overlay of all of it is that we must make a good faith effort as a school district um, to try to help all of our, our graduates meet all of the minimum standards. So when we go asking for a waiver from the state, if we have a student who, need, who we need to waive a credit for um, or we need to make an exception for, they're gonna want to see that we've first tried several interventions or that we made an attempt. And so um, we're working through that with all of the seniors um, or the handful of seniors who we're concerned about right now with regard to their on-time graduation. There are three policies that we are paying close attention to. The first is our competency-based credit or our, our credit competency. Um, right now, the way we have it written, which is similar to many districts in the guidance of WASDA, is it's really a world language policy. Um, and so students can have competency-based credit, um, earn credit towards graduation for having competency in another language. Um, we're going to expand this and take advantage of the opportunity we have, um, which is in, which is not against anything. It's just that we haven't before and add language arts and math and others that we may need to so that we can provide competency credit to some of our other students. The second policy, so that's going to require um, a slight revision, which we will be updating you on. It's an administrative policy, but we'll still update you as, as is our practice. Our equivalency credit for high school courses is 2413. This allows us to give cross equivalency for our courses. That's already existing, but we're certainly going to be working on that um, as well. And then lastly is the waiver of high school credit. Again, we already have this in place, but this gives us the authority to waive credits for certain um, uh, courses that a student may be in, um, may not have been able to complete or who were on track to complete but have had this disruption. So we'll work through all of these, work within the parameters that we can. We're not looking to cheat the system. We're not looking to cheat our students, but we're looking to reward the students and, and make sure that they're not penalized because of the closure of our brick and mortar schools. Any questions on graduation? Uh, this is Vicki again. I just wanted to comment on Fred. Um, so I want to assure the board that we are tracking seniors very, very closely. Um, we have been tracking them, um, the students that fall in the category of the possible waivers, 
and looking at what we've done and what we can continue to do to help them get across the line because our first choice would be to let them be able to graduate with the credits that they've got and not have to consider waivers but we also aren't going to keep a student from from being able to move forward just because of what's happened and um, just for students who are on IEPs we are working very very closely with with our our, our special education staff to look at some of the challenges that, that some of our students that are on IEPs are having with this type of learning. So just wanted to assure you that uh, that is probably every day that's happening where we are tracking students, re-updating our list, recalling, talking to parents, making sure that these parents of our students and the students know what's going on. So I think that's, that's a great philosophy and I also would hope we See at the for the kids, the seniors who are looking for grades. I think we've got two camps: one who wants letter grades, and one who'd be happy with pass fail. And I hope we can be accommodating to both sides of those seniors. Um, you get to choose how you want to be taxed, <laughs> and you get to choose how you want to be punished. In many ways, I think uh, allowing students to choose how they want to be rewarded, especially in this type of circumstance. Uh, would be useful. So my two cents of feedback. And and David, we we've heard that conversation a lot as districts are working through the same pieces that we're working at. Fred and I were having it right before this meeting. Is what are we hearing from um, our colleagues as we work with districts in our region? The next slide is about athletics, and um, I don't have a lot of good news to share here. The spring 2020 season is canceled. Um, summer is unknown at this time. And even fall of 2020 um, still has some what ifs that we have to navigate. You can see the decision making bodies that are included in this. And of course, the parameters for student safety and spectator considerations. This is very similar to what we have to work through when we think about large celebrations for our students as well as the spectator and the student safety considerations and how do we navigate that. But we did want you to update you on where we are with ath athletics as I started with. It's, it's, there's no good news here and um, we feel for our student athletes. Um, and I really don't have much more to say in, in, along those lines. Any questions? The last piece is summer school. So this is a, one of those pieces that we know we've always had summer school, but um, we need to start um, considerations for what will it look like um, as we move through the summer? What are the restrictions that are gonna be that could actually impact the model if we just move forward with our model as it stands in the usual circumstances? Um, or is there some other interest? So I know Fred's been doing a lot of work with this and working um, with our middle school administration who normally doesn't participate. Um, Fred, can you kind of walk us through this? Sure, just, you know, we are preparing for the fact that it is unlikely that we'll be able to run our summer school in a in an in-person uh, model. Um, so we are already considering what does the online uh, model look like or a hybrid if we're allowed to bring in small groups of students at one time. Um, so lots of things being uh, considered. That first one of the late July or August, I think that one even when we were thinking about this a week ago has already come and gone and I think we're pretty resigned to the fact that it's probably going to be online or hybrid. Um, just want to remind everyone that our summer school is really de de designed um, for high school to support credit retrieval. Um, those students who are deficient on credits because of either circumstances in their life or they failed a class and they're getting credit retrieval, um, that's our focus. We have done some PE and health uh, and it really depends upon uh, capacity for the program. For the middle school and elementary, um, the goal is really not to close the gap because of this disruption in our typical learning year, but really looking at our students who were already behind coming into the, the brick and mortar uh, closure. 
and figure out how do we help those students close some gaps and or at least not regress even further. Um, I think there's going to be, if I'm honest, I think there will be demand for parents wanting more. And it really comes down to can we staff it and what does that model end up looking like? So we're going to be looking, um, uh, we're going to be looking to do a number of um, different ways to to talk to our staff about this. Um, we're already underway tr um, with with the process of identifying students and um, seeking staff who will want to work with us. So more to come on this, but um, we're working on models at all three levels. Can I ask where our uh, funding for the summer school comes from? Funding for summer school comes from the students themselves. Um, we're not a district with a large Title I budget like other school districts where sometimes it's paid for um, through title funding. Uh, in our case, it's a uh, cost neutral uh, program and students pay for um, different, uh, they pay different amounts depending on the, the access to the program they're wanting. Okay, thank you. And Director Jin, that's across the system. So we have run a K-5 summer school to, for students and we actually do start planning that even um, in the spring, to start identifying the students who um, need those supports. As, as well as at the high school. We have not um, had a middle school summer school program. There's not been an interest or a demand for it, but it is something that we are starting to contemplate. But it is fee-based as well. Any other summer school questions? So we always try to end with something that is a little thought-provoking. And um, I, I would also like to, to share with the board is, is certainly we are in transition time to Director D'Souza's um, point earlier, but we as a leadership team are starting to think forward. What's the future um, going to look like? Um, establishing a group of, um, I, I'd like to use the word future ready, but that's already um, a, a key word in a movement that has to do with technology. But um, what does the future look like for Mercer Island School District and for our students? And so we, the, the group isn't completely formed yet, but it will start with a small core group of um, our leadership team that we're really going to challenge to think creatively um, some outside of the box as well as some inside of the box innovation. We'll have to include our, our facilities experts on that. Um, and then we want to expand that group to bring in our MIEA partners. Um, there's no point in us trying to build something without including all of our stakeholders, parents, and of course you the board as well. So um, as, as we move forward, we definitely need to be thinking beyond um, next week, beyond the end of the school year, beyond summer school and looking at next year. There was an article and I will share it with the board in, in um, our, the update tomorrow, uh, frankly, out of the LA Times that um, had a lot of the different um, speculations of what could be the restrictions that are going to be put in place. What are governors and public health going to say of how we're going to do school? And then, of course, what are the implications for our staff in that? We've heard some of this as superintendents in our conversations with the state superintendent. Um, you know, people, and then we do get questions. I get questions about, well, can you make next year more days because this year has less days and um you know some of those pieces are are labor negotiations and so we do have to work through the calendar is negotiated so bringing our 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 labor partners early to have the discussions of how do we um, how do we move forward in certainly something that is completely disruptive and uh, disrupted and very different than than what we've had before, um, I think Director D'Souza was referencing some of the same, probably the same article that, that I read that was talking about staggered starts or um, half the class comes on Monday, Wednesday and half the class comes on Tuesday, Thursday and then Friday is the blended online piece. And so how do we, how do we work through that and um, build something that is really going to keep students as the priority and continue to serve the whole child? That is a great concern because um, we know that the students who are um, 
going to come through this and they, and they are, are, are going to be um, impacted um, mentally, emotionally, and we need to be um, super cognizant of that. Um, and, and, and frankly, academic performance um, probably needs to be secondary to how, how are our kids um, coming through this as the whole child. So, um, you know, one of us in every one of these meetings always has to remind everyone that this is a, this is a health crisis and a pandemic and um, we need to be making sure that we're putting um, the empathy and the caring um, first and for, foremost in those decisions. So with that, I will turn it back to President Lurie. Um, we don't have any other slides for you. Okay, um, do any board directors have any pressing questions or comments that they wanna ask now and if it can't be done in another setting? And I'm, again, not trying to discourage, I just wanna respect time and we're way over. I'm not seeing anyone say anything. Okay, so one quick, first of all. Yeah, Deborah, can I? Okay. Well, because, um, yeah, can I say something? Deborah, is it okay? Sorry, I hit unmute at the same time I said sure. Yes, go ahead. Okay, no, I'm so happy to hear, Donna, that we are moving forward uh, collectively uh, as a team to re-envision what our new learning environment is gonna be like for Mercer Island. And I, I love the fact that we've been putting equity at the base of, of all, all of our conversation. And, you know, so part of the equity, there is a humility component in that we real, uh, recognize that as educators and policymakers, we do not sometimes represent all or reflect the experience of those we serve. So that's why it is actually so imperative that we include the feedback and the engagement from the very, very beginning. And, so, and another part of equity is that we have to be willing to challenge the status quo, which you're talking about, that moving forward, we have to really reconceptualize what this does look like. And so as we're doing that, you know, we're building this new model together. And so our current way of doing practice of very kind of segregated and um, inform the decision after the matter of fact, uh, sometimes, you know, may not be fast enough. So for example, for the uh, past, uh, no past grade, uh, I hope that from this very get go, we are including students and family and letting them inform uh, choices that they have. And so actually I agree with uh, Director De uh, D'Souza that why, you know, if we allow students to choose a letter grade or a non-pass fail kind of grade option. And so those kind of things that we have to uh, include them from the very get-go, instead of letting them know of what our decisions are and then have feedback afterward. So I hope we uh, consider uh, involving more students and parents in that. And also just one comment about the attendance. Attendance and engagement, and I hope you guys flush this out, that the engagement, um, you know, uh, what does engagement mean? Is it to, uh, to submit a homework or does engagement mean an interaction between teachers and uh, students? And so just kind of like, again, if we're focused on equity, that sometimes the engagement is not a reflection of the students, but it's rather a reflection of us. If we don't reflect students' needs or if we're not understanding their uh, concerns and so just um, be wary that when we talk about engagement, that it doesn't uh, ding them if they don't engage in the way that we stereotypically think is engaged in a classroom. And Director Din, just to that point, we have, we have at least one, I think we have several students who have chosen to literally move to other parts of the world during this. And they're in time zones that they can't even participate unless they're up at two in the morning in some of our times here. And some might say, well, that's their own choice for moving. We say, that's not probably the student's choice. So we've got we've to be able to adopt um, new practices to allow them to participate. And so I couldn't agree with you more. And that was the conversation that the middle school and high school team had um, that I was part of and I was so excited about, which was engagement isn't binary in terms of attendance. Right now, our attendance is, did you show up and, and sit down? or are you not in class right now? And I think this is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to rethink attendance and engagement because you're right, it's not about the Zoom call or an email. It might be 
um, a private chat that the student really needs because they need some tutoring on something and they don't want to be in the whole class or they need it at a different time because they're taking care of a sick parent. So um, could not agree with you more and I think our schools agree as well. Wonderful, thank you. I think even the use of the word attendance um, is going to change. The defini definition of it is going to change because um, as public educators, when we think about attendance, um, frankly, it, it gets tied to funding. And um, we use the word attendance here because that's how um, everyone has always viewed it of. I have to go to school so that I can get marked by my teacher so that uh, my, my parents don't get a phone call from Skyward saying I wasn't there. Um, so this really does does create a shift. And those are some of the shifts we've been talking, I've been talking this week with principals and we've talked about what are some of the silver linings that um, this crisis has created and, and how do we um, take advantage of those silver linings and move them forward. Some of it has been the, um, I think uh, our principals referred to it, the amazing collaborative work that our, our teachers have done in that um, guaranteed viable curriculum for all of our students. So. Um, Good work, hard work, um, all during this very disrupted time. So we, um, myself and my team, we thank you for your um, your thoughtful feedback. We will we continue to to want and take this from everyone. Um, we know that sometimes people think that we don't. Um, take their feedback because we might not do what they've asked us to do in that feedback, but we are, we are considering all the emails and all of the, the um, information that is, is coming to us, um, much of it in abundance. <laughs> so, Deborah, back to you. <laughs> okay, I, Brian, I've never heard you be so quiet, but, um... Do you is it, no, you're good. Okay, and so we will have an opportunity at the, at the meeting next Thursday to do board reports and to really kind of make statements. But I wanted to, I want to thank you all for being here. I'm sorry we're a little bit pressed for time. I think we could probably go on for like another hour and a half with questions. Um, but I think, you know, Donna and I really wanted to have this meeting with the announcement as things change um, to, uh, just highlight the fact that school is now changed for this academic year. Um, one quick note to board members, um, on was one of the WASDA calls, uh, there was a suggestion to do some sort of um, visual uh, voting. So what I'm gonna ask everyone to do is to, um, four note cards, um, and I'll send an email with this too, but four note cards that you can hold up um, to show your vote so we don't have to do a roll call vote every time. Um, one, uh, one card with yay, one card with nay, one card with abstain, and then one card with question slash comment. Um, and that way I can see and can, can uh, call on you and then we also can just do quick votes on especially on some of the more mundane things. So let's try that. If someone needs note cards, um, let me know. We can, oh, Brian, Brian's got them, he can distribute. Oh, the red, the red, green, and yellow. That was an idea, but I wanted to have the question and comments too. Um, so that, that's why I just use the Sharpie so we can see it. Um, and I think I just need to adjourn, right? We don't need to emotion. So, and again, thank you everyone for your time um, and all of your hard work and look forward to seeing you all again next week. Bye. <laughs>